that uh, began with Jesus' tempting. If we go back just a little bit further, we also see that Mark actually begins with the baptism of Jesus. Mark wants to get right to the point of the gospel. He wants to get right to the Jesus is here to start his new kingdom part of the gospel. So we actually don't get the birth of Jesus story from Mark. We get that from the other gospels, which is great reason for having the others so that we get a fully rounded out story about Jesus and his life as Serge shared a pit this morning from Luke to encourage us a little bit about who Jesus was when he was a, a young, young boy. So at the very start of this, Mark jumps right into it and wants to get right to the importance of the mission that Jesus has. Last week we heard from John about the calling of Nathaniel and how he already saw him before he even knew where he was going to go and he saw him under the fig tree, which is also uh, an allegory for someone who is studying the Torah, someone being sitting under the fig tree is someone who is studying the Torah. But Jesus saw him before he even knew that he was going to be following Jesus. Jesus already knew he, who he was going to call at this time. Not all the disciples were fishermen, but these four that he called in this passage here certainly were. And so Jesus used an illustration of something that they knew in everyday language about fishing, and he used that to say to them, come and follow me. Now, it's very important that we read this story in the context of what was going on here. Now, I don't know about you, but in this culture, the fathers take after their son's business. So we don't know how many generations these families have been fishing in this place, how many generations these boats and nets have been passed down from father to son to son to son to son and further on. It's something that you just did. If your father was a blacksmith, you were a blacksmith. If your father was a fisherman, you were a fisherman. And that's what you did. I actually fathered and followed in my father's footsteps too and learned from him to be a cabinet maker and followed in his footsteps also. And it's something that you did then. This day and age, it's very rare that kids follow their parents into what they do. We want to try and find out what's right for our children because not every child wants to be a fisherman. <laughs> not every child wants to go and do that. And perhaps they have different gifts and abilities that we want to encourage in them. But in this era, that was the plan for these men, that they would take over the family business, that they would take over the family job of fishing for a living. Now, this was their livelihood. It wasn't their pastime. When we think of fishing, we think of something a little bit different. But for these men, this was their livelihood. It was their life. It's what they'd planned for their entire lives, that they would spend their lives fishing, bringing in fish to market, selling them and being able to feed their families and their extended families and look after their parents and do all of those things. And all of a sudden, along comes this preacher and says, leave everything behind and follow me. I wonder how that would work out if I walked down to the river and walked up to one of the boats and just said to one of the guys there, leave everything you know behind and come and follow me. Repent and follow me. Do you think any one of them would actually listen to what I had to say? Probably not. I'd be very surprised if they did. Because they don't know me. They don't know anything about me. But if we say to someone, repent and follow Jesus, most people will have some idea of what you're talking about. They'll have a general idea of what that means. And yes, of course, Jesus was saying, stop sinning and follow me. But what he was also saying is, repentance means to turn around to change direction, to leave the direction you were heading and head in the direction that Jesus is going. So he's saying, leave behind the way you were heading and follow me for my direction. Of course, Jesus wants us to stop sinning as well. That's part of it. But a big part of it is to leave behind what we had planned for ourselves and to follow Jesus for his plan. It was funny, we were just driving back from the um, youth... Um, ice skating that was on, on yesterday um, with Jacob, it was just Jacob and myself in the car and there was a song on the radio by a guy called Robbie Williams and one of the first lines it's one of my favourite lines, he says I just talked with God and he just laughs at my plans and this is just a normal pop song, it's not a Christian song that God laughs at the plans that we make and he's going really that's what you're going to do well I've got other ideas, I've got other plans, I've seen you under the fig tree I know where you're going to head, I know what direction you're going to go and if you head down that path, you're going to go the wrong way. You need to repent, change direction, and follow me for my path. At some point in our life, we all need to make that choice. To say, I'm not going to go my way anymore. My way doesn't work. My way is not good enough. Might have worked for Frank Sinatra, but it doesn't work for me. 
God says, stop doing it your way and follow me for mine. And that's what's going on here. Our job as Christians is to be fishing or calling others to God's kingdom. This passage specifically talks about fishing. And I know fishing for livelihood and fishing for pastime can be a very different thing. But there are some similarities. So we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to go fishing. How do we do that? How do we go fishing for people? Some people believe that there is only one way. But then when we look at the diversity of people Jesus called to be a part of the twelve, we see that even he knew there was more than one way to catch a fish. Not all twelve were fishermen. Some of them were tax collectors. There were all sorts of different people involved in what was going on, in what Jesus was doing. They weren't just fishermen. But there are some important aspects of fishing that I want us to consider as we consider fishing for people. Because we're all called to do that. Don't be mistaken that this task is not just for the disciples of Jesus, the 12 apostles, and a few televangelists. This is all our job. I'd like to remind every Christian, if you're a believer, all we need to do is if every single believer helped one person come to Christ, we'd go from 2 billion Christian believers in the world to 4 billion like that. And if every one of those just helped one person come to Christ, the entire planet would be Christian. It doesn't mean you have to go out and convert 30, 40, 50 people, 500 people, 1,000 people. If you spend your entire life and only one person comes to Christ because of your faith, that's also part of this calling. Your job is to be fishers of people. I like to take the men part of it out of here because that ignores all the women because Jesus wasn't saying just men. It was written in a very patriotic society. So Jesus is saying we need to call everyone, all of our friends. So some of the important aspects of fishing. Who's ever gone fishing before in their life? There's only a handful. I would have expected way more than that. Put your hand right up if you've ever gone fishing. Have you ever been around people who've been fishing so you've got some idea about fishing? Keep your hands up. Okay, so there's several more there. So you might have seen some fishermen. So you've got some idea. I actually like the the fruits of the labour of fishing more than the actual pastime itself. Um, My brother is the fisherman in our family. But one thing that he made very clear to me uh, growing up, because he was a keen fisherman, he taught himself, he learnt from others how to do it. He said there is is no inherent um, gene that helps you to catch fish. It's not like someone who we say is a green thumb who can really garden well and makes a garden bloom and some people just got it, some people haven't. He said there is nothing special to it. It's like a science. You mix the right ingredients and you get the right result. So it's all about knowing what you have to do. The very first aspect of fishing that we can consider, that we can think about as we come to Christianity, is you have to go to the fish. I can't sit in my apartment upstairs and just... Pray that the fish will come and enter my fridge. It won't work that way. I have to go to where the fish actually are. I have to go to a river or a lake or an ocean, uh, get in a boat perhaps, and go out and go to where the fish actually are. And sometimes when you're fishing, that can be a big secret. Because I know in Australia, one of my friends, he's an elder of the last church that I was at, He went fishing a lot. He had his own boat and he would go a lot fishing um, and he loved it. It was just his, you know, it was his dream to have what he has and he has now a a boat on a marina uh, where he can park his boat at his house and uh, he can jump in his boat whenever he wants to and just go out and spend a day fishing. But there, they keep their fishing spots a big secret. You don't share your fishing spot with somebody. It's like sharing your gold mine with someone, you know. If you know where there's a good spot to catch fish, You don't tell anywhere else, otherwise 10 people will be there tomorrow and they'll catch all the fish and you won't be able to go there again. So if he ever did a favour for someone, and it was a fisherman, he'd say, just give me one of your fishing spots. And then in return, because they didn't want to give him a fishing spot, they'd say, how about five crayfish instead? You know, crayfish is like 100 Australian dollars a kilo or something like that. So they were giving him like, you know, $500 worth of crayfish, rather than tell them their secret fishing spot where they go fishing. That's how big a secret they keep it. That's why it's important to know where the fish are and to go where the fish are. If we stay in here and try and fish for people, we might catch the odd one or two that strays through the door by accident. 
I don't know about you, but I've actually caught a fish by accident before. That poor fish. I went to go trout fishing at a place where you can actually do it. Uh, they supply rods and everything. I was a little kid, and my line was terribly tangled. It was just a mess. It was just, I don't know, it, lo it looked just like a spider's web. It was, it was not a great look. And I thought, I'm never going to untangle all of this. And I was dejected. But I thought, I'm just going to throw the cast out anyway. So I still casted it out with this big mess on the end of it. And somehow I caught a poor fish who tangled himself up in my tangle. He wasn't even hooked, but I tangled him up and brought this fish in completely by accident. Now that's a one in a million shot. That's not going to happen very often. That's not the way you go about catching fish. So yes, we might get the odd person who just happens to walk through the door, hears the gospel and changes their life and becomes a believer. Praise the Lord when they do. That's fantastic. But we generally have to go to where the fish are. We have to go to where the fish hang out before we can even start to think about catching them. Then you need to know the fish that you're trying to catch. Did you know that? Because different fish need different methods to catch them. Sometimes you need to have a float on your line to catch a fish. And you watch the float bob up and down and the fish is biting at your hook and you know that there's going to be a fish at the end of it. Some fish, the much bigger fish, you don't need a float for. You need a great big line of hooks that they call gang hooks, which has got four or five hooks the size of a mm, two-franc uh, two coin, you know, the really big hooks, and they're joined together, four of them in a row, to catch the bigger fish. If you tried to go out and catch one of those big salmon, uh, Atlantic salmon, on these tiny little hooks with a float, you'll never catch one. So you've got to know the fish that you're trying to catch, know what they like to eat, know when they eat, because... You've got to know when to go out and go fishing. There's a reason why fishermen don't go in the middle of the day to try and catch something, because the fish don't eat then, and they're not interested in your bait. They're having a rest. They're probably Spanish fish, and they're having a siesta in the middle of the afternoon, and they're having a rest. They don't like to be caught in the middle of the day. So you need to know your fish. We need to know the people that we're reaching out to. We need to know the people that we're meeting with. Yes, again, you can by accident snag a few by standing on a street corner and not knowing anybody and just screaming at people until somebody relents and gives in and comes to Jesus. That can happen. But it's not the best way of catching fish. Usually the fish that we catch are people we know intimately, really well, friends, family, workmates, people we know. Because we have the right message for those people, because they know us as well. They know how the gospel has impacted our lives and changed us and made us who we are. And they have seen that transformation and see that change go on in our lives. So we have credibility when we share out the gospel with those people. When we share the gospel with those people, they listen to what we have to say. Because they know what our actions are. They know that our actions speak louder than our words. They know us really well. But also we need to know about the kind of people that we're out to get. Just for a simple way of looking at it, if you try and reach youth with exactly the same message that you do with adults, you'll probably miss the mark. If you're trying to uh, reach a culture of, um, I don't know, in the, back in my day, it was the skater kids, the kids who hung out at the local skate park. I don't know if they have much of those here in Switzerland, but in Australia they've got so many parks and places, they build skate parks for the kids to hang out in so that they've got somewhere to go and something to do. And they built these things with the ramps and the kids go with their skateboards go down there. If you don't know that culture and you just turn up with your Bible, you might be lucky to convince some kids to come to faith in Christ. But if you live a part of that culture, if you're a kid and you're a Christian and you're into skateboards too and you join that group and you're a part of that group and they get to know you and you get to know them, you get an opportunity to share your faith. You've got to know your fish and you've got to know who you're trying to catch. You've got to use the right bait and the right equipment. If you don't use the right bait, you won't catch the right fish, unless you do something by accident, like I did with the tangled mess. But if you're catching, well, in Australia, whiting is one of the most sought-after fish. If you're trying to catch whiting, you need gents, little maggots, fly larva that you put on a hook. The, fit, the whiting really love those, and you've got to use those to catch the, the whiting fish. If you want to catch something bigger, like a salmon trout, you need a small fish on the end of your hook. If you want to go out trout fishing in a river, you need a fly because that's what salmon eat. They eat the flies. So you've got to use the right bait. As Christians, sometimes we tend to think that one bait will do for everyone. 
that we use the same bait for everybody. Now listen carefully, that does not mean we change the message of the gospel. It just means we change the way we deliver it. The gospel is the same every day for everyone. But you can deliver it in many different ways for many different people. Some people need to hear, you're a sinner, you need to turn to Jesus because you're heading down the wrong path. They absolutely need to be slapped around the head saying, wake up to yourself. But you know what? Not everybody needs to hear it that way. Some people need to hear, you are loved. Don't be depressed that no one loves you, that no one cares for you. You're loved because Jesus loved for you. He died for you on the cross. So different people need to hear the same gospel in a different way. We need to choose the right bait to catch the fish that we need to catch. As I alluded to before, we need to know the right time to fish. Because if every time we get together with our friends, we just turn the conversation some round to the gospel, when somebody else is sharing something completely different, people will just look at us like we're weirdos and we're strange. You've got to know the right time to throw the bait out, the right time when you're going to be fishing. It's not always the appropriate time to throw the gospel message out there. You might be doing more harm than good by doing that. So you need to know the right time to share that. And you know what? When somebody's coming to you and saying, I'm stuck, I don't know what to do, my job isn't going anywhere, my faith isn't going anywhere, I don't know what to do, that might be where you get an opportunity to say, here's a chance. Have you prayed about it? How about I pray about it for you? Would you like to pray together? That's a great opportunity to step in and, and start getting a chance to share your faith. That might be the perfect t- chance to do it. We need to know the right time to fish and be wary of that. And one of the last points about fishing is you've got to remember that not all the fish are yours to catch. I know that sounds strange, but my friend Bob, who's got his boat on the marina and he goes out fishing every day, I, keep, I used to always joke with him about how much it cost him to catch the fish because, you know, he bought a boat and then a bigger boat and then a bigger boat. I think he's up to... His, uh, his surname's Shorty. He's probably going to be watching this video later on. Uh, it's Bob Short is his name. So his boats are all called Shorty. So he's up to Shorty 3. So he's up to Shorty 3. If he gets Shorty 4, that's going to be a pretty decent sized boat, but I don't think his wife's going to let him buy that one. So because of the cost involved in in buying the right equipment and doing what it is, he's counted that cost and said, for me, it's worth it. Even if I go out the whole day and don't catch a thing, it's worth it. Sometimes they're not my fish to catch. Sometimes those fish are going to be left in the water for someone else. You might do everything right, you might have used the right bait, the right equipment, the right timing, know the fish, you might have done everything right and you still don't catch the fish. Do you know what? Maybe they weren't your fish to catch. Maybe somebody else is going to come along and catch those fish. Maybe somebody else is going to come along and it's their job to catch them. Not all the fish are yours to catch. We think that everyone we meet and share the message with will magically believe. But sometimes we're just helping somebody get from one point in their faith to the next, and that's not a bad thing. There's a helpful scale that I've heard about that I've shared with previously called the Engels scale. And it's basically a guy came up with an idea that if you talk about zero point being the point where somebody makes a a decision for Christ, some people are plus one Christians or plus five Christians or plus ten Christians, say plus ten is... Uh, you know, the most mature Christian you've ever met in your life, right? And then there are some people who are non-believers and not everybody is a minus 10. You know, a complete, say, on the other end of the spectrum, a complete atheist who never had anything to do with God, never will have anything to do with God and doesn't want to know anything about God. So there'd be a minus 10. Zero is the point of conversion, plus 10 mature, minus 10 doesn't want to know. Some people are at minus 1 and it might not take much for you to share the gospel with them and they come to zero. And that's fantastic, praise the Lord. We all want to celebrate those zeros. They became a Christian, that's awesome. We then need to remember that we have to help people get from zero to one and two and three and four and five and so on because we're all called to grow in our faith, aren't we? Who likes just staying a baby their entire life? No one. We all grow and mature. We should do the same as Christians. But there are some people who are minus 10s. If you speak to one of them, 
it's not really that likely that you will get them to a zero. It's a possibility, sure, but you might make them question stuff enough just that they go from minus 10 to minus 9. And that might have been your job. Might be the next person's job to get them from 9 to 7. And then the next person's job to get them from 7 to 3. Or the next person's job to get them from 3 to 0. We all in this together. We're not doing this alone. Our job as Christians is to share our faith and let God do with the results what he does with the results. We put the work in. We put the practice in, we prepare ourselves, we have the right equipment, we know who we're fishing for, we check to make sure that we've got the right bait, we actually go to where the fish are. We do all those things that God calls us to do and then we leave the results up to God, not up to ourselves. Finally, I want to ask, would you give up everything you know like these disciples did and the future that you have prepared for yourself are you prepared to give up your life to go fishing? Are you prepared to give up your way of life and go fishing? Because repent doesn't always mean stop being a non-believer and become a believer. For some Christians, it's stop heading down the path that you've made for yourself and follow the path that Jesus has made for you. For some Christians, it's for them to know You've been doing good and you made a decision for your faith, but, you know, you're really not heading in the direction I want you to go. Maybe if you've got back onto my path, you might find that things go a bit differently for you. So sometimes repentance as Christians means that we have to change direction. As I've shared before, it's like your GPS telling you, please make a U-turn at the next available opportunity. Turn around and head in the right direction. You're going the wrong way. What are you prepared to give up to go fishing? What is it you're prepared to give up? Your job, future, security, your savings? It cost my friend Bob a heck of a lot of money to catch one fish because of the boat and the effort that he's put into doing it. What does it cost you to go fishing for men and women? Most Christians won't even give up their doctrines for Jesus. They know how to fish and you won't uh, change them for anything. They'll only do it one way and that's it. This is the only way I know how to do it. That's the only way I'm going to do it. That sometimes they're the kind of Christians who want to try and fish with dynamite. You've seen those funny commercials on TV or movies where somebody throws a stick of dynamite in the water and all the fish are shocked and come to the surface of the water. It's not really fishing, is it? That's cheating. And they want to slam their fan on the fist and just get into my boat. Now that might work from time to time. But very rarely will you find most people in a modern culture today who will respond to that kind of a fishing. Most people need to get to know the person before they ever start to believe. Most people don't care what you know. They want to know what you care about. To follow Jesus, we need to cut loose everything that stops us from fishing everything that we're worried about and just go. Sometimes we need to take the first step and just go to where the fish are. It's scary and you think you don't know what you're doing, but you do. Do you know how many situations I've been in? I've studied at Bible college full time for seven years and then done that part time study on top of that as well. And there are still some situations where I'm in and I'm going, I don't know what to say next. Do you know what I do? I pray and say, Holy Spirit, I'm stuck for words. What do I do? I just recently watched the Martin Luther movie and in that they shared a, a point where he felt exactly the same way. He just didn't know what to say and he said, can I have a break? And he needed a break to go and pray. Sometimes you just need to shoot up a prayer and say, God, I'm stumped. Don't know what to say. Give me the right words. And do you know what? The Holy Spirit's faithful and he does. He helps you through those times. Sometimes we just need to get off of our bottoms and go out to where the fish are and just, as the Australians say, have a crack, have a go, give it a try. Put yourself out there and go to where they are. We need to stop everything, even fear, everything that stops us from going out fishing, we need to stop that and go. If you want to be better equipped to go fishing, for people. Let's leave the analogy behind. If you want to be better equipped to be makers of disciples 
and to be trainers of Christians. Get involved in a growth group. Now, I call them, as I said, I've explained this before, I call them growth groups because they help you to grow in one way or another. But they come under all sorts of shapes and forms and banners. I've put a new list up on the um, uh, notice board there that reminds you of the growth groups that we have. If I've missed any, which I was worried I might have missed the Thursday night one when we talked about it earlier, if I've missed any, let me know and I'll happily add it again. There's just another bit of paper that needs to be printed out. It's not hard. So if I've missed any, tell me. But we have eight different kinds of growth groups. Did anybody know that? We've got that there. Eight different kinds of growth groups. Now, that can be someone who meets in somebody's office for prayer, like the Saturday morning growth group. That could be someone who meets in a restaurant where, four me where a few men get together at lunchtime in a restaurant and share the gospel with one another and encourage one another. That can be a growth group. It can be a growth group when we meet in someone's home and we share together a, a, a Bible study or a, just share in fellowship with one another. It can be when the young adults spend some time together praying for one another and then going out and doing something fun. That can be a growth group. Growth groups can take all sorts of shapes and forms. And some of them aren't as difficult to put together as we'd like to think that they are. So, if you want to be a part of a growth group, check out the list that's on the board there. If there's something there that doesn't suit you and you think, I know another one that we could start up, ask one of the elders. We will fall over backwards to try and help you to get a growth group started up that might suit you better. You don't have to be a Bible college student to run a growth group. Sometimes you just have to say, let's meet at this time at this place and then we'll talk about where we go from there. Sometimes that's all it takes to get started. The young adults do it so easily. They just put together a, a WhatsApp group and send everybody a message and saying, what are we doing this Friday night? How about we all go out for a movie? Do you know how easy it is to do something like that? Sometimes we can learn from them. We make it so difficult. But if you want to be equipped to be able to do this stuff better, that is one of the best places you can do it. You can do it a little bit here at church, sure, but that's one of the best ways you could do it. Get involved, be a part of it, and ask one of the elders to help you to start something up special. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together. We pray that you continue to bless us and encourage us as we go out into this week. Help us to be your people in your place at your time. Help us to be fisher people for you. Help us to go out and fish for people in a way that does justice to you. Help us all to remember that there are people in our lives that we can share the gospel with. Help us to be sensitive about how we do that and help us to do it well. Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, you guide us in everything that we do, in every conversation that we have, so that we can be looking for ways that appropriately share the gospel with the people that we're around. We pray these things in your name, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.